Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hi everyone, so today we'll be speaking about biomolecule delivery for cell signaling in tissue engineering. So we know that the tissue engineering triad is composed of cells, scaffolds and signals. So signals will be the aspect we'll be focusing on today. So what are signals? So signal is a function which conveys information. So in a cell, each and every activity and function is con uh, controlled by signals. So the signaling is used to communicate with other cells and also from the environment the cell takes in signals. So uh, this was essential for multicellular organisms to evolve. So it was a very crucial aspect especially in tissue engineering thereby. So ability to control these signals would in theory give us complete control on um, making a tissue grow in the way that we want because that is what is naturally being carried out by the organism itself. So the three kinds of signals which are present are chemical, mechanical and electrical. So when it comes to chemical signals, there are growth factors, mitogens and morphogens. So growth factors, um, so they are small uh, soluble uh, proteins which are produced by the cells itself and they act as signaling molecules between cells like hormones and cytokines. They help in proliferation, growth and differentiation of cells. Um, so something to note here would be that growth factor is a term which is uh, frequently confused with cytokines. So what is important to notice that growth factors usually always imply a positive effect towards cell growth whereas cytokines can have a neutral or a positive or negative effect on cell growth. <clears throat> the reason for both of them to have an over um, uh, clash in uh, terminology is because cytokines derived from the uh, immunology field whereas growth factors um, uh, derived from the developmental biology field. So there were, were many proteins which are found to be having the same function in both the fields. So, uh, so in tissue engineering we would be referring to growth factors to refer to all the proteins which affects cell growth, migration, proliferation. So even mitogens and morphogens we would broadly call them as growth factors. But to speak on what mitogens and morphogens are. Mitogens are usually proteins that initiate cell division whereas morphogens control generation of tissue form that is the tissues form the structure that it takes. Uh, so it um, ends up having a concentration gradient so based on the concentration gradient the tissue ends up taking its form. Uh, mitogens and growth factors could be confused to have the same effect too at times because sometimes uh, growth and um, cell division are interlinked. So in mammalian fibroblasts for example, um, uh, cell growth regulates the cell division and also at times the uh, growth factors would activate the mitogens, so uh, indirectly initiating cell division. Sometimes a uh, growth factor can be a mitogen or morphogen like VEGF and BMP. So uh, there is some level of overlapping between them. So it all depends on how the cells are wired. So based on that the growth and proliferation could be interlinked or to a great extent or not. So uh, now the question is why do we use growth factors? So we can always see in tissue engineering that there is an advantage to using biological materials like a cell for treating a, a disease. So uh, having a cell in the scaffold uh, ends up meaning that the cells are able to produce these growth factors and proliferate the cells and improving the healing time. So there are also constructs in which we don't use cells. Even here the growth factors are important because you want the uh, cells to actually migrate to the side of wound and end up healing the uh, area. Uh, now a question would be, so if we can use cells then why use growth factors separately? So when we are using cells uh, it will be useful to add uh, growth factors because it can enhance the regeneration and also the differentiation. So example is TGFB in uh, you know, bone regeneration and BMPs in osteoindiction. So now on how these growth factors act. So 
uh, like all signaling molecules, these growth factors bind to specific receptors on the cell surface and they activate an intracellular signal transduction system and thereby it acts. So the growth factors do not act in an endocrine fashion because it has a very low uh, half-life usually. So it is not usually released into the bloodstream to act on far, far off um, organs or tissues. So it is usually uh, in a local area. Now the complexity of this growth factor interaction can vary with the receptor. So one growth factor might activate multiple receptors at times uh, and each of uh, and also it can activate multiple receptors on different cells and end up having a different effect on each of these cells. And something which adds to this complexity level is the factor, fact that the ECM, the target cell location, the concentration of the growth factor, all these play a huge role in how the uh, growth factors act. Now uh, this is an image of the growth factors, uh, common growth factor families, uh, their source, the receptor and the function. So in here you can see that uh, the first uh, growth factor for example, the epidermal growth factors, uh, there is mit it acts as a mitogen at the same time uh, for ectodermal and mesodermal uh, cells and also promotes proliferation. So this uh, for epithelial cells. So this goes to show that how growth factors can actually have a lot in common with mitogens and morphogens and also at the same time have a different effect on different cell types. Now the clinical applications of growth factors are not limited to just tissue engineering. So we will take a look at what the other applications commonly have been used for. Uh, so after chemotherapy when there is a low uh, white blood uh, cell count. Uh, gran granulocyte colony stimulating factors are given to increase the uh, WBC proliferation and uh, get back the count to normal. And even before stem cell transplants, usually you, um, the stem cells are taken from the bone marrow. In that case, it is a painful process to actually take it from the bone marrow. So an improved technique is actually to give a growth, factors, uh, growth factor which induces the uh, stem cells to um, proliferate and thereby come out of the growth uh, bone marrow sorry bone marrow into the bloodstream and from the bloodstream it can be easily collected and uh, um, transplanted to the same patient or the another patient uh, then in alleviating anemia uh, low uh, rbc count or in low platelet count or all these aspects we can use uh, growth factors are being used so now the hurdles in using growth factors in tissue engineering so the most critical aspect in using growth factors in tissue engineering is its delivery to the right site. So uh, we can always think of injecting this growth factors to the site that we need as a bolus injection. injection. Um, so now the problem there is the half-life of these growth factors are very short. So BFGF has just 3 minutes and VEGF has just 50 minutes. This, these are very short actually. So uh, we would have to actually inject a large dose of this growth factor so that we have any considerable amount of growth factors which can act on the tissue and bring about the effect. So this high dose in turn ends up leading to other side effects like edema or an increased risk of cancer. So this is something which we would like to avoid and also growth factors are quite expensive to produce. So the solution would be to actually use advanced drug delivery systems. So what is the advantage of using these systems is that they are able to give a temporally and spatially controlled release profile. So they can give a sustained release of these growth factors from uh, these delivery systems for a prolonged period. So conventional delivery systems usually can't do this. A mass amount of large dose of growth factor is not required when you use a delivery system. And also it is able to go to the right side and act in the right hand man alone thereby reducing the side effects too and also it is not exposing the growth factors usually to the biological environment thereby reduces the rate of its uh, degradation by the uh, system. So the approaches to deliver growth factors mainly include uh, immobilization or encapsulation of these growth factors onto scaffolds or matrix, uh, else using nanoparticles for delivery of these uh, growth factors or else gene based approaches using nucleic acids. Uh, so this shows an overview of all these three approaches. So there is um, delivery of uh, growth factors by using nanoparticles or immobilizing them on a scaffold or a matrix or else gene delivery um, using nucleic acids uh, into the cells 
So when it comes to immobilization or encapsulation of growth factors onto a matrix, there are three approaches again there. So one is physical encapsulation, another one is chemical conjugation, or there are approaches wherein it's ECM inspired from the extracellular matrix of the body itself. So in physical approaches, um, what we do is we end up um, uh, physically in encapsulating these growth factors uh, into a uh, scaffold or a, a polymer and you put it into the site of the disease and it's, uh, the growth factor slowly diffuses out thereby um, uh, causing tissue regeneration and healing of the uh, wound site. In chemical conjugation, the growth factors are conjugated onto a matrix chemically and then it uh, is again implanted into the tissue site and it stays there and ends up uh, helping in proliferation of the tissue and tissue regeneration in the end. Uh, so first we look at physical encapsulation or immobilization techniques. Uh, so the first one is physical encapsulation of growth factors by mixing the growth factor in a polymer before its gelation uh, so that the growth factors are trapped inside the uh, polymer and you can uh, transplant it. So the um, yeah, advantage of this is it's quite easy uh, to uh, make and also the properties of the scaffold and also the growth factors are not affected much. But the disadvantage is the loading capacity of growth factors into these uh, polymers would be quite low. Uh, the second physical encapsulation technique is absor uh, absorption of growth factors onto the surface of the matrix. So here uh, a preformed scaffold is taken and the growth factors growth factor is actually just dropped onto the surface. Here it just gets absorbed onto the scaffold and it stays there. The scaffold with the absorbed uh, growth factor is implanted in and then um, it releases over time. But here the issue is since it's just absorbed onto the surface, there is this possibility of burst release happening which is not uh, preferable because it can cause side effects by spiking the concentration of growth factors in the body to a higher dosage than required. But the advantage here again is that it's an easier technique. Uh, then the third physical encapsulation technique is layer by layer self assembly. Here what we use is a poly electrolyte. So poly electrolytes are layered uh, and uh, the growth factors are sandwiched in between. So poly electrolytes have uh, uh, different charge. They can be poly cations or poly anions, positive or negative. So the growth factors based on that charge too can be just sandwiched in between and we can go for multiple layers as shown in this picture. So there can be multiple layers of growth factors uh, sandwiched in between these polyelectrolytes. So here what the advantages are that we can, uh, con we have a very good control over the delivery rate. So there is no issue of a bur burst release here. Um, then coming to chemical conjugation, uh, one of the most commonly used technique is carbodimide coupling immobilization. So carbodimide uh, coupling involves cross-linking the growth factor to the scaffold, uh, usually using a cross-linking agent. So uh, the example here is a covalent immobilization of VEGF uh, and angiopoietin, two growth factors um, on a porous uh, collagen scaffold. So the advantage is it is quite simple and you get a very high conjugation ratio um, uh, and a low cost. But the disadvantage is during this uh, coupling, uh, when you cross-link the growth factors onto the scaffold, it can lose its functionality if its active sites are altered. Uh, now coming to the second chemical conjugation technique, it's a uh, muscle inspired uh, bio uh, conjugation. So here muscles are these organisms that grow on the beach, on the rocks, you would find them attached uh, in the sea. So um, they actually use uh, a chemical called DOPA which can very strongly attach to almost all surfaces. So similar to that, we have, uh, what has been developed is uh, polydopamine using dopamine, uh, which can do similar, um, uh, which can, which has a similar property to dopa. Uh, so this dopa can be coated on almost any scaffold surface and the growth factors can be made to um, conjugate onto it. So the advantage is that it's a strong adhesion. So uh, you would get a high affinity and also stability. So there won't be a burst release or uncontrolled release pattern here also. Uh, the disadvantage is again as previous chemical conjugation technique, the growth factor can lose its uh, functionality during the immobilization technique. Now the ECM inspired immobilization approaches. So 
uh, in the ECM we find a lot of proteins or uh, molecules which can actually control the release of growth factors. They act as reservoirs by having a very high affinity towards these growth factors and thereby altering how the growth factors are distributed in the environment. So one such uh, molecule is heparin sulfate. So it has a very high affinity to growth factors like BMP2 and VEGF. So uh, you can use these molecules to actually coat the surface of your um, uh, scaffolds and uh, ensure that the growth factors like um, the ones which have affinity towards heparin sulfate end up um, getting immobilized on the surface. Uh, so the advantage is it mimics the ECM. So uh, it is much more natural uh, environment that we are simulating here and uh, we get a very good sp uh, spatial and temporal control. Another ECM based immobilization approach is adhesive protein based binding. So just like heparin sulfate, there are proteins too like collagen and fibronectin which have affinity to certain growth factors. So based on that, we can even coat the surface of your scaffold with um, uh, these proteins like fibronectin or fibronogen. Uh, so the example given here is BMP2 which has a high affinity to fibronectin fragments. So uh, we can do that and ensure that the growth factors remain attached uh, stably onto the scaffold. Another approach inspired by ECM is using the uh, structure uh, that the ECM provides. So um, biomimetic ECM nanostructures can be achieved using your scaffold itself. This too can in improve the growth factor uh, affinity towards the molecules. So the next approach in uh, delivering growth factors we are going to look at is nano carrier based uh, approach wherein you use a nanoparticle to deliver these growth factors. So the advantage to this is nano carrier based delivery has already been studied quite well because it is commonly used in drug delivery systems and mainly the advantage of using this technique is uh, it can have a very high loading efficiency and also it can quickly uh, respond to environmental stimuli such as temperature or pH. So spatially it would be easy to control. So it can go to the target site and only then release the growth factors which is a great advantage. Also they protect the growth factors from the bioenvironment thereby not uh, preventing the uh, thereby preventing the growth factors from being degraded easily by the uh, physiological system. So the first uh, nanoparticle based system we will be looking at is synthetic polymers. So synthetic polymers like PLA, PGA and PLGA these are widely studied in drug delivery. So um, PLGA is uh, uh, FDA approved and also it protects the drug inside and it is well studied. So one problem when it comes to PLGA is it is poor affinity to the proteins when it comes uh, to physiological conditions. So the protein retention might be low. So the uh, proteins can actually leach out in the physiological environment. Protein based nanoparticles. So albumin is a protein which has been widely studied for this application. Mm, uh, so it has multiple drug uh, binding sites. So you can conjugate the uh, growth factors quite easily and also their surface properties are well tolerated by charged polymers. Uh, they are biodegradable and also they are easy to fabricate and they are reproducible. So usually a, a stabilizer coating is given to um, these nanoparticles, um, uh, usually of glutaraldehyde or other polysaccharides. This is done to prevent aggregation. So an example of this protein based nanoparticle approach uh, which has been integrated with the microarchitecture approach which was previously mentioned uh, is this study. So wherein uh, uh, chitosan alginate coated uh, bovine serum albumin nanoparticle was used. Um, so two different um, growth factors as you can see has been incorporated into these nanoparticles and they have been arranged based on their uh, ch uh, charge in a biomimetic nanostructure. So it has shown that uh, it has a very sustained release. So you can see the uh, two growth factors releasing in a very controlled fashion in a very sustained over a sustained period. So it is around 30 days it is releasing for. Also the uh, micro architecture has been shown to have a synergistic effect along with this growth factors in improving the cell behavior. 
So the example shown here is BMP2 which has been encapsulated in a polysaccharide based nanoparticle, uh, chitosan based um, and also um, it is arranged in a polyelectrolyte complexation fashion which was uh, similar to the layer by layer approach that we saw. So chondroitin sulphate which is similar to heparin. Uh, is able to easily uh, um, attach to BMP2 because of its high affinity. Uh, it forms a complex and um, chitosan uh, ends up complexing with this uh, due to polyelectrolyte because of the charge uh, the charges between them and they form a na nanoparticle. Other nanoparticles which are worth mentioning are uh, liposomes which has been widely studied for drug delivery applications. So it is a fossil pit bilayer vesicle actually which has hydrophobic and a hydrophilic region. So based on the uh, molecule of interest you can incorporate it in the hydrophobic or the hydrophilic region which is an advantage when it comes to delivering nanoparticles. Uh, but aggregation is one of the issues uh, in uh, liposomes. But this can be overcome just like previously discussed by giving a polymer or a polysaccharide coating. Uh, another nanoparticle worth mentioning is mesoporous silica. Uh, it is a silica nanoparticle with a lot of, uh, it is the very porous structure. Uh, it has a very high surface area and the particle size can be easily con uh, controlled uh, and um, has a very high uh, good biocompatibility, even the liposomes have a very good biocompatibility. Uh, so, burst release can be eliminated by uh, giving a polymer coating. Uh, now coming to the third approach that we will be talking about is the gene based approach. This is a little more complex method but it offers us a lot more approaches wherein you can um, activate or deactivate genes which are already present in the cell or else if you want you can even introduce new genes which are not present in the cell. So that is something which this uniquely, this approach uniquely offers. Uh, so the steps mainly involved in delivering a gene into the cell involved, first a complexation or condensation of this nucleic acid uh, and a nanoparticle formation. Then this nanoparticle is, then this nanoparticle is taken into the cell by a, uh, via endocytosis. So it forms an endosome um, bilayer around this um, nanoparticle. So now the um, payload has to break out of this uh, bilayer that is the release of the cargo into the cytosol. So if the payload is um, small interfering RNA which can go and bind to mRNA and stop trans, uh, translation into proteins, uh, it would take its action in the cytoplasm itself. If it is a DNA which needs to be carried into the nucleus, it is further taken into the nucleus wherein it can uh, incorporate um, with the host DNA or it will stay as uh, plasmids. Then degradation of the um, delivery system that you use inside the cytoplasm that is very important because it can lead to cytotoxicity. So that is something which we look at, we look at avoiding. So the delivery vectors usually used for delivering um, nucleic acids are viral or non-viral. So in the viral vectors the advantage is it has a very high ef uh, efficiency of delivering these uh, genes but at the same time safety is a concern and also low payload. So the safety concern is that although the virulent part of these viral nanoparticles are deleted out, it can always mutate back into being virulent. Yeah, that is the disadvantage of viral uh, vectors. So non -viral, uh, when it comes to non-viral vectors, they are less immunogenic, so they are much more safer when compared to viral uh, vectors and also there is a higher payload but its efficiency is quite low. So uh, both of them have a difficulty in delivering uh, genes in the in vivo delivery. So the solution to this is to actually take the cells out into an ex vivo um, uh, environment and then transfer these cells with the gene of interest that you want and then reintroduce them into the body. Okay, now after looking at the uh, chemical signals, we move on to mechanical signals that are used for tissue engineering. So uh, mechanical signals are normally used by the cell to actually grow, proliferate and also in almost. So the normal development of most tissues require some sort of mechanical forces to be involved. So these are few of the mechanical forces which are in the development process of a tissue. So spring forces as you can see it is similar to a spring wherein if it is compressed it tends to relax. So this is what drives the uh, sperm cells to penetrate the eggs. The osmotic pressure is something which activates egg cells. 
and sheer stress which is found in um, the heart wherein the blood is pumped by the heart and it experiences a sheer stress on it and this also actually affects the endothelial cell differentiation and is quite important for the development of these tissues. Something which is in interesting to observe is that uh, only about 10% of the postnatal changes in a bone strength is influenced by hormones whereas the rest like around 40% is just by mechanical factors. Uh, now moving on to electrical signals, these are also very vital for the development of the tissues. So uh, it has been shown that endogenous electrical fields are usually formed uh, at wound sites to direct uh, cells uh, towards this wound site, thereby um, helping in wound healing. So when this electrical fields are not present in wound sites, it ends up compromising how the wound healing takes place. Neurons cultured in electrical fields have been shown to alter its direction and rate of nutrite extension based on the parameter of electrical simulation. High doses of growth factors can pose serious side effects. So we also need studies to ensure that we can uh, send the growth factors at the only required concentration. Oh, no. High doses of growth factors can pose serious side effects. So we need to study and make sure that mm, the control release of these growth factors end up giving only the concentration that is required for that. Uh, so cells are just one of the aspects in tissue engineering and we need to put the cells, scaffolds and signals together which requires a multidisciplinary approach. Thank you.